and now uh, Christian will also talk about uh, programming languages, in particular Rust. Um, Christian has been a long-term contributor in ITF and in uh, Riot. In ITF, I don't, how long, Christian, have you been in ITF already? Christian? How long have you been in ITF already? Like five or five years or so? And uh, well, his presentation on Rust is about fixing Michael's problems, uh, health problems, <laughs> cost uh, for the long weekends uh, using uh, ch fixing memory safety in, in C-based applications. And, and that's it. Welcome. So uh, hello. I'd like to introduce you to the topic of using Rust on the Riot operating system. And based on the on what I what I'll try to verify later, um, I think it's a good idea to focus on the Rust language as a as a whole, and then um, basically show show what you could do with it. Um, before that, maybe a bit of introduction. Um, so my name my name is Christian Amses, uh, known as Chrisen on IRC. Uh, I've been developing this and using this for about a year at the Tandem Beat project, where we are working on getting. Uh, the power grid more accessible to uh, to embedded devices, and we're using uh, Rust on Riot there for basically building prototypes and, and testing systems. Um, so just to, to verify that I catch you where I should, um, how many of you have? Um, okay, let's start that way. Uh, how many of you know what Riot is? Okay, uh, thanks for showing that you listen to me. Uh, <laughs> Now, um, who's, uh, who's, who knows roughly what the Rust language is? Uh, who has written any Rust code and be it only modifying an example and running it? That's okay, maybe 10 hands, and who has written more than 1,000 lines of Rust code? Okay, I think I'm, I'm, I'm about right on, on, on going primarily about, on about Rust. Uh, so Rust is advertised as a high-level system programming language that is memory safe, has zero-cost abstractions. Um, I, I'll try to cut the, the buzzwords short. And rather than that, I'd like to take you on a tour through the Rust language, um, starting from C, because I suppose most of you know C, and, and show what it can do, sh um, show, show its features, and show that it is usable both for embedded development and for develop development on the Riot operating system. And well, if you like it, you may consider using it for projects that are built on, on Riot. Uh, so let's start with the simple things where Rust is largely similar to C. You can define functions, you can declare your variables, um, you can uh, have control structures, for loops, while loops, if you can have arithmetics, uh, so far, looks like C with different letters and keywords. Uh, a few differences um, are visible here already. Uh, variables are immutable by default, so if you want to change a value, then we'll have to say that beforehand. Um, then again, what we don't need to say is, is types. So we do have to declare types on our functions because that's what other people will interact with. We don't necessarily have to declare types everywhere because there's type inference and B is returned, so B is the same type as old B and A is the same, so it's all 32-bit integers. And uh, what we see on the top bottom here is an implicit return. You may know this from Perl. So if a, fu if a function ends with a, with a variable, um, that's just returned. And that's quite helpful when using a more functional-oriented um, style because you, there you can just modify your things and pass them on. Um, structs are quite similar as well. Um, nothing much to show there. Um, but as all high-level languages have it, um, you, can, you can use a method-like syntax on struct. So if they implement something, yeah, use it. Um, enums are something that's heavily used in C as well um, and can be used just the same way in Rust, but is way more powerful because enums in Rust can be used to implement additive or are additive types. So you can have several, um, you can have uh, data within your enum uh, variations. And the whole thing kind of behaves like a, like a tag union. So you can have, for example, a thread status if there is one 
but nothing if there is nothing or n or some error value with an error description in it, and the whole type will only be um, as large as the largest uh, member plus a discriminator, or maybe not even that, because in this case, um, that enum fits in a U8, but it doesn't utilize all the values that um, that could be in there. So uh, maybe thread status is probably, and in the current implementation it is, um, just a single byte as well. So that's one of those zero cost um, abstractions where we can use high level features but don't pay the additional bytes overhead for it. Where things get um, more tricky and then again way more powerful is the whole man memory management area. So before we had our numbers in, in variables, again, uh, immutable or mutable if we declare them so, that's a value that this particular uh, function or stack frame owns. So whoever owns this is responsible for cle clearing it up. If it was dynamically allocated, it still has a pointer or even a zero-sized thing, but something on the stack who created it or passed it or has or got it passed to cleans it up. Um, if you want to reference something, you can create from your mutable thing that you own a mutable reference. Such a mutable reference can be, there can only be one mutable reference that can be passed on. Who has the mutable reference may write to it. Who doesn't have the mutable reference or who handed out their own mutable reference cannot write to it. Uh, this ensures that there is no aliasing, so everything the compiler sees in terms of arguments that are passed to a function, uh, the compiler can be sure that it is what is in C language uh, restricted. This allows for various optimizations. Um, the immutable references can be created either from a mutable reference or from an own value, and there can be arbitrarily many from of them. And under certain conditions, they can even be shared among threads. And whoever has such a reference can be sure that um, that they may actually read from there without further consideration for is there anything atomic I need to do about it? Unless, of course, the implementation inside does something funny. Um, one, one good thing about those references is that if you're past the reference, you can be statically sure that you, don't, you are not responsible for cleaning that up. So all these uh, things that happen with smart pointers where you have documentation that tells you now you receive this pointer and, and you, you have to clean up after that, or sorry, not smart pointers, just regular pointers, you have to free that when you're done with it or you must not free this until whenever. These are all checked statically by the compiler at compile time or by the, by the language at the compile time rather than relying on documentation to make sure that these constraints are upheld. Still, there is something that's called uh, raw pointers. Through those, you can do everything that you, can, that you want to do. So this, um, but if you do that, you have to declare that you are doing unsafe things, and I'll come to that a bit later. Um, I think we're well in time, so I can give you an example that probably um, looks familiar to people who are familiar with the GNRC um, package buffers. When you receive a, um, when you receive a message, um, you get ownership of a, of a particular um, package buffer. But you, there may be others that, um, so, sorry, uh, you get ownership of a reference to a package buffer. Um, when you pass that data on to some data processing function, you don't necessarily need to go through the whole increment the usage counter, decrement the usage counter game because um, you pass it to that function, that function will return that reference to you before, um, before the end of its lifetime and there is no need to, to do any dynamic management here. Whereas um, later, if you turn that into a, into a writable package snip by using the start write function of those package buffers, um, you need to be the only one who has access to this one because otherwise there may be someone still reading from that while you mutate it. Um, I mentioned lifetimes. So um, lifetimes in this case mean uh, usually mean lines of code. So the lifetime of 
um, of this reference could be until uh, probably about here because there's not a reference returned. Uh, Rust is usually rather smart about those things, so you really need to be explicit about how long those things live. Um, and if Rust gets confused about it, it will produce meaningful error messages. Um, using the raw pointers, as I mentioned, is something that requires much more care because then you're in the land of potentially potentially having concurrent access, having aliasing, any of those things. So you have to be explicit about this is something where I know what I'm doing. Now I'm allowing unsafe operations. This doesn't kick all the rules of the language out of the window, but it does allow manipulation of, of data behind those pointers. So you can do all those low-level things like accessing a register, writing a value in there, which you have to do because this is a microcontroller and that's the way you interact with it on a driver level. Um, you just have to make sure that the constraints that are required about that are upheld. And there are um, sufficient abstraction features in the language that, or um, encapsulation features in the language that help you keep the, um, keep the management of those constraints local to a particular module. Um, if I'm too fast or too slow, um, please interrupt me anytime. I'm glad for any excuse to go over time. Okay. Um, one last thing um, before we get into the embedded area or maybe already a, um, a pointer there um, are traits. Traits are one of the most important um, abstraction mechanisms in Rust and they are a bit like interfaces you may know from other languages. So a trait is, uh, is a property of an object that is described independent of its implementations and that describes that an object can be interacted with in a particular way. For example, that it has those methods or that it has associated data types. And later on, um, other objects can implement that trait by filling out those uh, functions with, with, actual, with actual code. This is, one, uh, this is one of the ways you can have things like uh, code inheritance in Rust. So there is no full-fledged object-oriented programming attributes and diamond and what's or not inheritance in there. But you can declare that, for example, an output pin always needs to be a pin. And if there are default implementations for handling a pin, that's not necessarily an output or input pin, um, those can be inherited through those. Um, through those traits. Um, I'll skip through generics because um, they probably better fit with the long list of other things I could go on for hours but are not necessarily essential for, for this talk. So there is, for example, a concept of arrays and slices that are um, always bounce checked. So there is no way you could accidentally have a one off by one error and grab outside your array, unless of course you resort to unsafe methods to do so. But there are many uh, ways of interacting with those slices and arrays in such a way that the bound, that the compiler can elide the bound checks by for example iterating through um, two data structures in parallel and then it'll only check at the last length, whether the lengths match and not uh, whether each individual access has to be uh, within uh, within bounds. Uh, so for um, for com for embedded development, there is one, th um, and this is more the the generic embedded development for stars. There is one thing that is immensely helpful about Rust. That is, there are crates that are they are kind of high level modules. Think libraries. Um, that primarily define traits. And that output pin example I had before was literally copied from one of those crates called embedded hell. And embedded hell is a hardware abstraction layer that describes how I2C, SPI, GPIO, um, devices, etc., can be interacted with. It does something very right, I think, that is, it does not try to describe everything about them, especially not initialization. And this allows those traits to be usable in a cross-platform way because how do you get an SPI device? How do you get a GPIO pin? Depends on your platform. On Linux, that may be opening a file that is identified by a string. 
on on Riot that's an American identifier on a bare metal platform that may be a pointer to some onboard peripheral. Um, but that crate doesn't deal with that. Um, that is dealt with by the various implementations of that hardware abstraction layer that on the one hand implement the traits and on the other hand also provide the methods of creating those, uh, those structures. For example, that, that GPIO pin here. Those crates are usually have a name that ends with HAL to indicate that they are the hardware abstraction layer for a particular library for uh, platform. For example, um, for EM32, there's a, there's a hardware abstraction layer, etc. And they are built in ba based on um, peripheral access crates that are created from the SVD files the vendors usually provide. And here's the nice thing where interoperability with Riot comes into play. Um, the same thing can be done on Riot. Just other than, than the native devices where we have register files, um, here we have the, the C functions for, for example, setting a GPI open or the types defined in C. Uh, and they can be imported from C and interacted with. And built from that, there is a crate called Riot Wrappers that implements many of those hardware abstraction layer generalizations. Um, Mo um, most of them actually, or many of them, not all, because uh, GPIO is actually not implemented yet because I didn't really have the use case for it, but there is, abstract, there is implementations for I2C, SPI, threading, you can um, implement your co-op server in Rust based on the G co-op library, you can implement child commands, and all the time you don't lose the ability to still access the hardware through the peripheral access crates. So if you have a situation where you want to time an ADC read particular, in particular to a timer channel, um, you can't, to my knowledge, do that in Riot. And you can just use the, the existing peripheral access crates for the, for the low-level hardware interactions of those kinds in parallel to using, to using Riot. Um, I'll give you just a brief glance on the on the level of inter of integration this has with Riot. So this is um, mind you, this is all an application that ships its own um, that's basically standalone and that works from the master branch of Riot. It just has a bit of make file code that invokes Cargo to build the to build the actual Rust code into a static library, links that in, and can can flash that onto your board. I've been using this, this mechanism for, for firmware development for about a year now. Um, it's, it has worked quite well for me. Uh, the main benefits I get from that is that Rust makes it way easier to spot errors at compilation time. So whereas in earlier projects I spent, I looked, I debugged maybe half the situations in the compiler and half the situations by actually stepping through the program in debug, in, with, with the debugger, now I'm at 95% of the bugs found at compilation time, either because the compiler um, complains, or because by the time I'm trying to express things in terms of references, I already find out that uh, something is going foul. Um, yeah, so uh, things are working. Of course, there can be more complete mappings. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, GPIO are, are still a bit GPIO abstractions are still a bit missing. Um, so far, I've only used it for applications, but I'd like to explore the possibilities of having packages uh, implemented in Rust that can be then just hooked into Riot, and I think Michael will make use of that. And the whole integration part of, um, of C and Rust gets a bit shaky when it comes to things like static inline functions or even function-ish things defined by the C preprocessor because the current tool link can't look into that, so a few things I have to redefine in the syscrate that I would rather just take from the compiler, but those are primarily things, I think, for, for optimization and for smoothing over the workflow that is, in general, working well for me. Uh, so with that, um, do you think it would work for you? <laughs>
How do I turn it on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have you said that Rust um, allows some kind of optimizations um, with the restrict stuff and anything? Do you have any experience on the code size and or memory stack requirements with Rust implementations? Um, I don't, I haven't run into the limitations yet, so I haven't um, done anything particular, I haven't done anything particular to slim, it, to slim things down to see actual numbers. Uh, there are a few things that, um, that by default blow up. Um, and right now, it's compact enough for my application. That's all I can tell you. And I'm rather confident than from, from other examples I've looked at that my current numbers are at least a factor of 10 over what they would need to be if I, if I tuned a few things here and there. So I can't really tell you much. Um, but in general, it should be possible to get to similar sizes as comparable C code. How is your uh, productivity as developer in Rust uh, if compared to C? Do you have any even empirical numbers? But um, I don't have. I did. I didn't track it precisely, so I can only give you a gut feeling. I'd say that I'm maybe 20% or so slower right now. Um, but then again, I'm much more confident that things are working when I change things later. So um, later for, for, for initial development, it's slower. For later changes, it's definitely faster because there's way fewer things I have to consider or look at. All right, another applause for... Thank you.